chapter 4, 1 to 10, of the problem and the remedy. Now, in life, whenever we're faced with a problem, we usually start to look for a remedy, don't we? A, a way to fix the, the issue that has arisen. So sometimes when a problem arises, we're able to find a remedy fairly quickly, aren't we? So if a light bulb breaks in our house, we no longer have a light in our room, we hopefully have a spare light bulb that we can get. We can go and change it and give light to the house, or perhaps we find a, a lamp or, worst case scenario, some candles so we can light up the room. And there are some things then we might not be able to remedy ourselves. So if we're not car mechanics and our car presents us with a problem, we go to the garage, don't we? We go to the garage, we take the car, and hopefully the car will be fixed. Or you call a plumber to fix your central heating, or if you go to the doctor because you're not feeling well, you're hoping that they'll prescribe for you the necessary medicine to fix the problem. Well, here in James chapter 4 and verses 1 to 10, we have a problem, and we have the remedy. And this problem is a grave problem, and the people that James is addressing, they need help to try and fix the problem that's occurred. They need outside help to fix it. In the first place, they actually need James to point it out. And James tells them that what they need, or more precisely, the person that they need to fix this problem, is God. So this is all I want to do this morning. I just want to speak about the problem. That's the first point in verses 1 to 4, and then the remedy in verses 5 to 10. Now James has written some pretty serious things here, hasn't he, in these opening few verses. Quarrels, fighting, passions, desire that leads to murder, covetousness that leads to fighting and quarreling, praying, asking God for things to spend on wrong desires. I mean, what we have here, what the picture that James is painting here is of a church or congregational congregations that are at war with themselves and they're at war with each other. Let's unpack a bit more what James identifies as being the nature of the problems in this church or potentially, as I said, these churches, these congregations. One scholar points out that these churches were mainly Jewish churches, but they were hounded by both Jews and pagans, so the, the Jews who remained faithful, who didn't like the Christians, as well as uh, pagans, of course, who, who thought that this was an illegal religion. But also, amongst their number, many scholars suggest that there were some converts who were zealots at one time. And zealots were quarrelsome, even violent political activists. They often got in trouble with the Romans because in order to get their way, as it were, they would resort to violence or to causing civil unrest. So if that is the background of some of the people in the church. And we've also already noted in the book that there was some contention in the church between the way that the rich and the poor were being treated. Uh, pride had become an issue. People weren't using their speech to build up, but instead to break down. And, and when you think of this kind of atmosphere, this context that was being found in the church, you, you can see the division that was evidently there that had built up. We have fighting and quarreling. That's what James says, or more literally, it, when you translate the Greek, wars and fights. The root of the Greek word for war is where we get, where we get our English word polemic. What causes wars and fights? amongst you. It's a pretty troubling picture that James is painting, isn't it, of the church? And the answer he gives is this, it's your passions. In other words, he's saying it's your own selfish desires, trying to get what you want for your own pleasure, regarding that that's the most important consideration in your life. What I want is what matters most. Sinclair Ferguson writes this, it is the insistence on my, on my way which in turn is a dangerous symptom of a not too well disguised narcissism, a love of self that is the antithesis of the love of God. It's a pretty awful way to sum things up, isn't it? I mean, the summary is precisely what's happening. So it's a terrible picture that we, we're, we're seeing, isn't it? And so the outcome of that behavior in this group of people is war and fighting. 
I'm in it for myself, you're in it for yourself. Tom, Dick, Harry and Sally are all in it for them, themselves. And what's that going to look like in any context? I mean, think of that in a sports team. You know, a football team where everyone's in it for themselves. I mean, there's going to be so little cohesion, isn't there? I mean, that's not going to breed success for that sports team because they're all in it to be the star person. The one who plays the best, the one who looks the best, the one who you know, scores the most goals or whatever it might be, gets the headlines. Or a business. Or a family. But what about a church? James tells us it's going to produce this kind of attitude, this kind of disposition. It's going to cause warring, quarreling, and fighting. That's completely the opposite of what life ought to be in a church. Whose people, as we learn in the scriptures, if, if we're believers, are supposed to be united to one another in Jesus Christ by his blood. A blood-bought family. Where we're called to love God and we're called to love one another. To put ourselves behind, second in second place, to put others first. But if we're in it for ourselves, to get what we can out of it, to make sure that that's the most important thing, then it's inevitable we're going to fight. It's inevitable there's going to be quarrelling. It's totally the opposite disposition and the life which is seeking to live according to the wisdom that comes from above. That's what James says at the end of chapter 3, isn't it? But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So if you're fighting and quarreling, then you're not living by that wisdom which comes from above. You're not living by God's wisdom. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that Christians won't have disagreements. But the question is, how do we handle those disagreements? How are we supposed to deal with those times when we do disagree with one another or that there are issues of concern? How we deal with it says a lot about where we're getting our wisdom from. And the Bible has plenty to say about how we work through those times of disagreement, those issues, those that questioning. Primarily, we go and talk to one another and listen to one another. And we do so with a spirit of humility. My own experiences of being a, a minister for now some 13 and a half years in the church, I can tell you, not talking produces distance. And distance eventually produces disunity. And disunity eventually produces division. The church is weakened. Satan wins a victory. Talking can often take away distance, brings understanding, and can even bring, begin a process of reunion. But James is talking about a seemingly worse situation than that. It's gone beyond this, if you like, where there's just the disagreements have, have arisen because we have wars and fighting that are driven by this, these selfish desires. James then identifies, doesn't he, the issues that are evident in the church. It's interesting, a few commentators describe verses 2 and 3 as a spiritual pathology report, where the symptoms of fighting and quarreling, or wars and fighting. The pathology report tells us what has been discovered that causes the trouble described in verses 1 to 4. You get these, what the main features are. So firstly, you desire and do not have, so you murder. I don't know about you, that kind of makes you want to see, it makes you sit up a little bit, doesn't it? And of course, because we're, we're not speaking about godly desires, but the desires that lead to war and fighting, desires that are driven by our passions, so we, we should know it, it won't lead to anywhere good. But it's a bit startling, isn't it? It leads to murder. But there's good biblical precedent for this, isn't there? James hasn't just plucked this out of the air to try, to try and bring something in to give some kind of shock factor. We don't know whether James is actually speaking about a particular instance that actually took place, or perhaps he's thinking back to events. So he might not be thinking about the particular context to which he's writing, but he might have been thinking back to the biblical precedent 
or the biblical event that took place some fa- 1,000 years before in Jerusalem with David, Bathsheba and Uriah the Hittite. And King David desired this woman Bathsheba that she was the wife of Uriah the Hittite. David took her, he got her pregnant and then had Uriah killed so that he would not discover David's adultery. Or perhaps James is also thinking about our Lord's teaching on the Sermon on the Mount. Particularly as what James has has written comes just a few verses after he says, uh, speaks about the danger of the tongue. He says, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. This is what our Lord is saying. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. See, I think what James is driving at when you think of both the events that took place with someone like David and also our Lord's teaching is that desire is the starting point that can lead to something far worse and far more destructive. It's giving in to what I want, where it begins in here, that can have such a grave impact out there. Even murder. That's the first thing then. You desire and you do not have, so you murder. The second thing, you covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. So covetousness is to desire something that someone else has, or maybe somebody that someone else has. And it's never a good thing. There's not one place where covetousness, uh, in respect particularly of of mankind anyway, let's put it that way, is, is ever spoken about as a good thing. It's a desire that's driven by jealousy and envy. And again, it's something James has mentioned already. He says, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. So if you covet something, not only do you want to have it, but you also don't want other people to have it. So think about, there's another biblical example, Ahab with Naboth's vineyard. Ahab coveted Naboth's vineyard, did it so much, he offered to buy it off him to begin with, but Naboth said no. He said, no, this is, this is my family's land. It's been passed down to me ever since we've, we arrived in Israel. Ever since God gave us this land, it's our land. So to s- sell it off would be an affront to my ancestors, but also to God who's given us this land. Ahab was unhappy. He coveted that land. So with his wife's help, Ahab cooked up a scheme to discredit Naboth, having him falsely accused of cursing God, and then he was killed. And Ahab took possession of the vineyard. Now, maybe an extreme example, you might say, but it lends credence to James's point. Covetousness will lead to fighting and quarreling. Thirdly, you do not have because you do not ask. This is actually about prayerlessness. James has spoken about the importance of prayer previously and with uh, encouragement to the church to be prayerful. If any of you lacks wisdom, this is in chapter 1, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given him. So if in verse 2a James was reminding us of Jesus teaching in the Sermon on the Mount... So does verse 3a, where our Lord says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. The problem is, they're not praying. They're not asking. They're not seeking. They're not knocking. And because you're not asking, James says, you're not getting. You're not asking God. God's not going to give you anything. And James has already encouraged us. He says, God is a generous God who will give us every good and needful thing. But the point is, he says, you have to ask. You're not getting because you're not asking. That's an important principle, isn't it, for for us today? If we don't ask, how can we expect God to give? And then fourthly, you ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. When we think as, as, you know, as children grow up, mum and dad might speak to them about prayer. 
and you, know, you encourage your children to pray, and it's something that occurs with most children early on. They start to think, well, if I pray, I can ask God for something I want. So Christmas is coming, so I want a new bike. So I'll ask God. Of course, we teach them that, you know, we try to steer them in the right direction. These are not the kind of things we, we ask God about. But of course, we're not talking, James isn't talking about teaching your children about what's good prayer and what isn't. Speaking about adults. But it should not surprise us if it comes from a disposition of unholy desires and covetousness. If they do not pray, then they do not receive. And when they do pray, they're asking for the wrong things because they're asking for things to satisfy their own desires. One commentator used the example of John Ward, an MP, many, many years ago, um, I think 19th century, um, who after he died, a prayer letter was found amongst his belongings. And this is what it said. O Lord, thou knowest that I have mine estates in the city of London, and likewise that I have lately purchased an estate in the county of Essex. I beseech thee to preserve the two counties of Middlesex and Essex from fire and earthquake. And as I have a mortgage in Hertfordshire, I beg of thee likewise to have an eye of compassion on that county. As for the rest of the counties, thou mayest deal with them as thou art pleased. So keep my stuff safe, Lord. Do whatever you like with the rest. But that's the point, isn't it? That's an example of using God for one's own desires. As a means to one's own end. And if there are a number of people doing this in the church, is it any surprise then that there are wars going on amongst brothers and sisters in the church? And then, and then James speaks about the problem or the diagnosis. He says, adultery, you adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? And James here, he's reminding us very much of the Old Testament prophets. Relationship between God and Israel is so often described as a marriage. And when you read prophets like Hosea and Amos and others, what, is, what God describes through his prophet is when the Israelites go after other gods, he calls them adulterers. They've broken the marriage bond. Well, this is what James is, is speaking about here. It's the same with the church. We spoke about as being united to Jesus Christ. In Ephesians chapter 5, when the Apostle Paul speaks about marriage, he then changes, he changes tact, doesn't he, almost, or, or changes course suddenly and says, well, I'm not talking about marriage, I'm talking about Christ and the church. So what... James is saying here, he's, he's picking up this kind of language. And he's saying, that's what you're doing. You're allying yourself. You're, you, you're supposed to be married to God, to Jesus Christ, but actually you're going off with the world. It's adultery. Because, of course, God and his church, the Lord Jesus Christ and his church, are opposed to the world, the flesh, and the devil. So that when Christ's people become obsessed with the world, when, that they when what they desire is the things of the world, then they're turning their back on their husband. We're turning our back on the covenant that exists between Christ and his people in order to have an affair with the world. And in doing this, then, we're becoming friends with the world. And this is where we have to consider our own lives, isn't it? Now, where do we spend most of our time? Or what do we spend most of our time doing? You know, when we're I'm not thinking, of course, about our jobs, those things we have to do. And they take up probably a good, at least a third of our lives. But outside of our jobs and the time we're sleeping, what are we spending most of our time doing? Is it with the people of God or engaging in spiritual things? Or is it with the people of the world? And doing the things that the world commands? Do we love the world more than we love Christ? Because that's what James is speaking about. So that's the problem. Those first four verses bring to us the problem. The spiritual pathology report. So what about the remedy? Verses 5 to 10. 
Well, James, P- James tells us that when people turn their back on God, it's because they've forgotten who God is. That we've forgotten his character. And James reminds us that God is a jealous God. Of course, this is not sinful jealousy. It's described in this way. It's God's proper zeal to rightly possess what belongs to him. It is the jealousy that only true and pure love knows. To possess the loved one entirely and to do so for their good and blessing. That's what is being spoken about there in terms of God. He's doing it for the good and for the blessing of his people because he loves them entirely. James is speaking about God in this way and it's the same way that God speaks about himself elsewhere in the scriptures. And the context of the Lord describes himself in this way is often within the context of announcing his covenant love and his covenant blessings to his people. From one perspective, it is a warning then. As God speaks about these things, this is what I've done for you. This is what I'm doing for you. This is what I will do for you. But it is a warning against disloyalty. Not to forsake him. But from another perspective, he's also telling us how much God loves his people. And his desire for them to know how he will bless them. And like a loyal husband, will always be with them and never forsake them. And it is out of this love and this devotion that he would even give up his beloved son for them. To save them and to send the Holy Spirit to dwell with them. James, in that sense, begs the question here. He's asking the question, in the face of such love and devotion, why why would you be friends with the world? Why would you forsake God? Because the world doesn't love you like this. The the world's not going to give you what you need. It's not going to be selflessly giving in order to provide for you, in order to keep you safe, in order to provide for your eternal well-being. Because in this world, there's war. We see it all around us, don't we? We read it in the news. We see it across the world. And not just the, the wars that go, that go on between... You know, Russia and Ukraine and the war that's going on in Palestine at the moment. Just the way that people treat each other, the way that people speak about one another, the disregard that they can have for another person made in the image of God. So in the world there's war, but with God there is peace. And the wonderful thing about our God is, and the the Bible speaks it out, but we know it in our own lives and through church history, is how patient God is. And even at times when we sin, his grace abounds, as the Apostle Paul reminds in Romans 5. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. And that's what James says. He says in verse 6, God gives more grace. However, that doesn't mean God winks at sin. Or the one who remains proud and defiant in their sin. Because as he says, therefore it says, as James says, therefore it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Yes, God gives grace and that's wonderful. And it's so necessary for us. But we need to recognize that we're sinners. And then humble ourselves under his mighty hand. But that only happens when we recognize that we're sinners. When we recognize that we have broken God's law and we have offended him. And it's that point then that we come to him in humility. And instead of coming with wrath, though that of course doesn't necessarily mean that we're not disciplined or corrected. Or perhaps that is what has brought us to our senses that we've we've, we've sinned in such a way and we've reaped the reward of that sin. But God so often comes with grace instead of wrath. We're reminded in many ways this morning. I mean, we, you know, when, when we sin, I mean, because we can read, I think sometimes you can read something like Psalm 14 and, and the, the psalmist is speaking about people in a different way, saying, you know, there is no God. You think, well, I know there's God. I believe in God. That's why I'm here this morning. But what 
you have to realize, or what we have to understand, is that when we sin, we're acting as if there's no God. In our hearts, that's how we're responding. Because we're willfully sinning against God. So our actions are saying there is no God. We're acting the fool. But what we do when, we, when we're reminded of that and we do recall our sins, because we do sin in word, in thought, and in deed, we, we do break God's law, then what's amazing is that we can come to God and, and repent of our sins. And God in his word, and because of his son Jesus Christ, says, and I'll forgive you. There's a guarantee of forgiveness if we come with humility and repentance. Even though we may have acted as if there is no God, God will welcome us back if we come humbly and repenting of our sins. That's his grace. But it does require that we repent. We can only do that if we come with a spirit of humility. But it is part of what we're to do as a church. And we even sing it sometimes, don't we, when we sing psalms like Psalm 51. We don't just do it that once a week, as it were, in the corporate confession. We sing about it as well, and we sing Psalm 51. We are, if we're singing it with our whole hearts, then we are singing, confessing, and thanking God for forgiveness. But to do it, we need a spirit of humility. So James exhorts the congregations and us with them. Verse 7, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Well, we have four features in our pathology report a little earlier. We have four parts of the remedy here. The first one's this, submit to God and resist the devil. There are many ways as we think of that, submit to God, resist to the devil. We've, we've been taken back to the, the battle that's gone on since the dawn of time, aren't we? To submit to God or to submit to the devil. Adam and Eve decided to submit to Satan and to his deceitful and cunning ways when he attacked God's word and its truth. They failed to resist the devil. Jesus showed us a better way. He showed us the right way when the second Adam, as he's known, appeared on earth. He showed us the right way to deal with the attacks of Satan. Humble submission and trust. Satan came tempting him. He came using the word of God, trying to twist it to suit his own ends, his own cunning scheme, to make Christ submit to him. But instead, our Lord resisted him. He clung to the word of God. He did so on three occasions, and on the third occasion, he sent Satan away, commanding him to leave him. It's an encouragement for us, isn't it? If we submit to God, to God's will, if we know his word, if we believe his word, if we trust in his word and the power of the one who dwells within us, we will resist the devil and he will flee from us. That's great encouragement for us, isn't it? And this submission to God and this trust in his word comes with another wonderful blessing. So we, as we see the attack coming like a, a small child in an uncertain situation, perhaps with new people around, will hide behind their father's leg, clinging on to him, or want to be picked up to sit in the safety of his arms. What we're told here is we draw near to our heavenly father. And he's our protection. He's the one behind whom we can hide, as it were to whose leg we can cling, and he will protect us from the one who wants to hurt us. So submit to God and resist the devil. Draw near to God and cleanse your hands. We draw near to God in prayer. We draw near to God as we come together, as we gather in the church in his presence. And that's the picture that's being painted for us here. It's the language of tabernacle and temple. The language of worship. We draw near to God to worship him. The Psalm 24 reminds us to draw near to God. We need to come with clean hands and a clear conscience. In the Old Testament days, that required a multitude of sacrifices. 
But now, as we saw in the book of Hebrews, entry into the presence of God for all his people required the shed blood of the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The writer of Hebrews says in chapter 10, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. See, we can only draw near to God when we've been cleansed and purified and washed. Cleansed in the blood of Jesus Christ. But to do that, we have to recognize what it is that we need. We must come with a spirit of humility and understanding of our sinfulness. So that when we draw near to God, we must, and this is the next thing, be wretched, mourn, and weep. Knowing that we are sinners. Knowing that we have grieved our Father in heaven, and that should be a source of sorrow for us. Again, James recalls the, the words of Old Testament prophets who regularly called God's people to mourn and to weep and to grieve their sinfulness before God and to return to him. For Israel and Judah, as we said, to return to her husband. When we come in this state before God, we come looking for cleansing. We come looking for purification. We come looking and we come with repentance and looking for forgiveness. Looking for the words of assurance that our sins have been forgiven. We come looking for comfort because as Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Sin is terrible. Sin is destructive. Something that we know, it's something that James has made abundantly clear. It's both self-destructive and it can destroy families and even the church. It's, it's not a laughing matter. Sin should be mourned. Because our Father who called us to himself, he even gave his Son for us and sent his Spirit to us. He's done everything for us. Has been offended, slighted, ignored. Confession, as we say, is good for the soul. But it's also necessary and right. And as we said, the wonderful thing about the God who gives us more grace is that when we come confessing our sins, he assures us that he is just and faithful to forgive us our sins in his son, Jesus Christ. And finally, we're to humble ourselves. If we've heard James at all, then by now we've humbled ourselves. If we recognize who God is in his thrice holiness, if we recognize that he is our king with full rights over us, and then we recognize ourselves and we see ourselves as we are with our own sinful propensities, then we know that we can only come to God if we humble ourselves. See, humility doesn't look at other people's sins or compare or contrast sinfulness. Humility recognizes one's own sinfulness. And we worry about our own relationship with God. Humility comes with more grace. And that's the wonderful and amazing blessing that God continues to give. He says, humble yourselves in this way. And the Lord will lift you up. The Lord will exalt you. In Psalm 30 we read this. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness. That's the grace of God. You know, we turn our laughter to mourning and our joy to gloom when we come confessing. But the Lord turns those back around. Mourning to dancing, gloom to gladness. Such is his grace. That's good news. That's gospel. James tells us, here is the problem that we're dealing with, the what and the why. We are the problem. Selfishness is the problem. Put an ego first. That's the problem. He says, this is the remedy. God is the remedy. Grace, his grace, is the remedy. What we need to do, what our responsibility is, is draw near to him. Submit to him. 
Humble yourself under his almighty hand. Because when we do that, it becomes about him. And how he can meet our need. And not about us and what we want him to do to meet our need. Because he knows what we need. He knows everything about us. Our past, our present, our future. He knows our worries, our struggles. He knows our sinfulness. We can't hide anything from him. But we need to put ourselves second. Put him first. Put others before ourselves. Put ourselves third then, if you like, if you want to peck in order. But when we do that, God draws near to us. And he gives more grace. And he gives us those things that we need. Or may the Lord, by his spirit, give us the strength and the faith to obey him. And in doing so, be blessed as individuals, but also together as a church. Amen.